Good afternoon, everybody. Am I in here by myself? Good afternoon, everybody. Now, each year I look forward to this meeting because each year you guys blow me away. So, in New Orleans, it was loud and it was impactful. So, I'm expecting y'all to take me higher this time. So, I want to say good afternoon. Good afternoon. There we go. <laughs> All right. So, today I want to thank you for coming and attending the seminar today. And as you know, uh, DAV is always ready to talk about women veterans. We talk about all veterans, but we talk about women veterans as well. And we will continue to talk about women veterans until the inequities are addressed. So, y'all ready to ride with me? Let's go. So, some of the topics that we're going to talk about, if my slides cooperate. We're going to talk, I'm going to introduce you to my um, Interim Women Veteran Committee. I'm also going to introduce you to some special guests that we have here today. And we're going to talk about some upcoming exciting times in DAV. We're also going to talk about staying connected, which has been the theme of the Legislative Department um, this convention. We really want you to be involved in the Benefits Protection Team, and we also want you to take advantage of the Commander's Action Network. So we're going to talk about those things again today. We're also going to talk about vol DAV Voluntary Services and the relationships that it has. And then we're going to talk about Boulder Crest Retreats. And they are here today to talk with you and share with you their mission. So first, let me introduce my interim, the DAV Interim Women Veterans Committee. Um, we are missing our chairwoman, Ms. Joanne Martinez. I want you to give her a warm round of applause because she will be leaving as chair this year and she has done a phenomenal job. So wherever she is, I need her to hear those applause. Give it up for Joanne. <laughs> All right, if you hold the rest of your applause until the end, it will be the next person we're going to talk about is Rachel Fredericks. This is her second year on the committee. Mr. DJ Eldra Jackson. This is his first year on the com committee. Also, Miss Helen Bennett. This is her first year on the committee, and I am the advisor. Now y'all can give them applause. <laughs> so let me tell you about the importance of the Interim Women Veterans Committee. This committee functions to be the boots on the ground, um, listening to you as you talk about ideas and things that are happening within your committee. They funnel those ideas up to me and we funnel them together up to the, com the national commander and the national adjutant. So that lets you know how much leadership thinks about women veterans and, and our needs. So um, please keep that in mind that DAV is always, always, and always uh, paying attention to the needs of women veterans and all veterans. Okay, I like a clicker. All right, so let's talk about some of the upcoming events. So coming out in September, if you all remember the DAV Women Veterans Report, let me see your hands in the air. Okay, so in 2014, DAV released uh, its report, Long Journey Home, um, which showcased 27 issues that women veterans face across the federal landscape. So in September, uh, DAV will be releasing an updated report. So I want you to stay tuned. I need you to stay in tune to DAV social media, Facebook, Twitter, um, Snapchat, what, uh, all mediums that are out there and available. Please follow us um, to, so that you can take part in all of the events that will be going on. We'll be having press releases. Um, your stories, many of your stories may be told. 
um, and just various activities surrounding it. So stay tuned to September 2018. All right, let's talk about some of the resources that are available to you. The DAV home landing page, this is where it all starts. Hopefully you can see this. This is where you will keep in touch with us and find out what's going on. So from this page, Mr. Shane Learman gave you a, a presentation, a wonderful presentation on DAV resources. Well, this is where it starts. Um, this is the landing page. So we're going to go from here to the next page. This is the DAV legislation landing page. So once you click the advocate button at the top, you will come to this page and you will come up to the Commander's Action Network. So for women veterans, what does this have to do with you? Well, we're going to jump right into that. So DAV also has a women veterans landing page. How many of you knew that? Oh, shame. <laughs> All right, so we have a women veterans landing page. And on that page, you will find a lot of information, um, DAV helping women veterans, um, when women come home, toolkit, current legislation, and issue briefs. Um, the issue briefs, the same issue briefs that you see in midwinter, they will be available here just as they are applicable to um, the women veterans. So let's talk a little bit about the toolkit. How many department chairwomen or men are there in here for your department? Can you raise your hand? I need to see all of you after this presentation. Um, we're trying to make, a, make some contact with you so that we can disseminate information out to you so that um, we can keep you in the know about things that are going on that you may not otherwise know. Um, if you're a chapter coordinator, if you're working in that space as a chapter, can I see your hands? Same thing. I want to see you after this uh, presentation so we can talk with you as well. The toolkit. So we're going to talk a little bit about what the toolkit is for. That toolkit is not for you to just copy our toolkit or the information that's in there. That toolkit is for you to personalize and make your own. So what you want to do is take that toolkit and find your local resources that are available to you, such as um, your women veteran program manager in your local VA hospital or your women veteran coordinator um, in your regional office. How many of you knew that there were women veteran coordinators in each of your VA regional offices? I like that. That's better. Um, and also the same thing about your hospital. How many of you knew that there was a woman veteran program manager? Even better. So I forgot to tell you when we started this, this is going to be an interactive discussion, which means that I have some goodies for you if you're paying attention. All right, so the next thing we're going to jump into, just remember, make the toolkit your own. Find your local resources and populate, make your little kit and populate it with the information that, that is useful to you and your surrounding area. All right, so how many of you were in, in the BPT seminar on Friday? Well, good, then this is not a repeat. So we talked a lot about what DAV Commander's Action Network is. How many of you have signed up for the DAV Commander's Action Network? So at the end of this, this presentation, I want 100% I want sign up. So if you cannot be signed up while I'm talking to you, because you will actually know how to do that in a few minutes, um, I will stick around. My committee is here to help you, and we will sign you up for the DAV Commander's Action Network. It is very important. It is your hammer in the toolkit. So if you've attended any midwinters and any of the last two midwinters, I talked to you about the three E's. I'm going to get my cape and my uh, Super E shirt for y'all next time. But the three E's are engaging, educating, and expecting. What you're going to do, the, the Commander's Action Network, the hammer, is what is going to help you engage your locally elected officials, and you're going to educate them on DAV's legislative priorities, and then you're going to expect action. You're going to expect them to do something with the legislation that they have in introduced. Remember, introduction is just 99, but we want 100%, so we need it walked all the way through. So you want to see it all the way through to its inaction. So we need you to take action by reaching out using the Commander's Action Network to talk to your, le your elected officials and ask them to support the bills that DAV is asking and advocating for. 
So right here you see an example of an alert. So what you will get once you sign up for the Commander's Action Network, you'll get something that looks like this, and it will have information on the particular bill, and then it will offer you an opportunity to take action. When you take action, you will populate this field. You will fill in your name and your demographic information. So at the very bottom of that, once you've populated all of the information, there are three things that need to happen that are very important. One is the Remember Me box. You want to make sure that that is checked so that you don't have to populate everything over and over again. The second thing is the email opt-in box. You want to make sure that you place a check in that box as well. And then the final thing at the bottom in the blue is the click here so that you've completed your submission. If any of you have been signed up for the Commander's Action Network and are no longer receiving um, alerts, please go back in to repopulate re, um, this information that I just gave you now because we changed over to a new system, so now um, we would need you to go back in there and just make sure that you're signed up for the Commander's Action Network. So I want to tell you, it really matters what you do. What you do makes a difference. So if you look at this presentation here, this slide, 16,000... Um, 137 actions were taken. I mean, per total activities. So we sent out some information alerts and so forth, and 16,000 actions were taken. But guess what? It resulted in over 80,000 uh, reactions. So if you tweeted or you um, sent in your alert or whatever action you took, it resulted in, in a, a higher number of um, impressions. So First, I want to say thank you for taking action as we have sent these alerts out, and I want to encourage you to continue to do so. So let's talk about how to get you signed up. So always technicals. So signing up is very easy. All right. So signing up is easy. So when you're at the um, legislation landing page, you're going to look at that Commander's Action Network box, and you're going to click that. And if you have your phones, and for those of you that have not signed up, you can do this with me. Once you're on, a, on the Commander's Action Network, you're going to go all the way down to the bottom, and it says sign up for action alerts. You're going to click that box. You're going to fill in your, your information, and um, for those of you that are taking pictures, the presentation that we did on Friday is already on the web, and it has all of these steps in more detail on there. Make sure you fill in all the information. Click the blue box again. And remember that you can do so on the phone. So I have a question. How many ways can you sign up for the Commander's Action Network? Five? How can you do it? Sir? You don't remember? Nothing for you. Ma'am? Um, she named several things, the phone, remember the phone, also your desktop or your laptop, and she even said go to the library and they can help you out too. Uh, you are a winner. <laughs> you can pick this up. All right. All right, so you can also find members here while you're at the convention. There are a lot of people walking around and they're asking questions like, what is DAV? Do you know what DAV is? <laughs> So I tell them, <laughs> it, it's a funny question, but I can tell you I've been asked what DAV is in the airport and everywhere else. 
But I'm glad that they asked because it gives us an opportunity to let them know about DAV and what we do and spread our mission. So when they ask you what DAV is, you tell them all about our mission and get them signed up. Anyone can join. They do not have to be dis disabled veterans. They don't have to be veterans. They can be your neighbors. They can be interested um, college students. Um, if they care about veterans' issues, then you want to sign them up. So take every opportunity to sign them up because it's very important that we protect our benefits. And if you don't do it, then you can't expect anybody else to do it. All right, so I want to re-hit on um, the social media aspect. You see DAV at DAVHQ. Follow that. Remember what's coming up in September? The release of something, right? Is something coming up? September 2018, the release of DAV's report. Remember, that is a very widely used report. Your leaders, many on the Hill, use this report when they're talking about women veterans' issues, and it will keep you in the know, okay? Um, and your department will be issued some books, so um, you can get those from your department leadership. It will also be posted online, so you can print it out for your own use. Um, but make sure you don't forget about it. Also, um, you can tweet at me, D-A-V-S love. I wanna see you. Um, remember the hashtag while you're here, hashtag D-A-V 97. Let everybody know that you're here. Hashtag D-A-V can. And for those of you that were with me on Friday, you remember I, every time I say D-A-V can, I think, yes, I can. All right, so next we have Mr. John Kleindice, and he's gonna talk to you about DAV Volunteer Services. But before he does that, let me introduce the rest of the, the panel. Um, Mr. John Kleindice is here. Uh, Mr. Dusty Baxley is on the end from Boulder Crest. And Ms. Stephanie Driesel is here. Uh, she is a Army veteran, and she participated in the Boulder Crest Warrior Path 032 class. Give a warm, warm, Round of applause for Mr. Kleindice. Thank you, Sharonda. Thank you, everybody. Um, it's very nice to be invited to this uh, seminar. Specifically, I wanted to talk about our mentoring retreat. But before I get into that, I'd also like to talk about volunteerforveterans.org. I saw a lot of hands go up for people involved in the hospitals in here or in their communities. It's a great opportunity for you to build a profile and get involved with that. Uh, that was my shameless plug for volunteerforveterans.org. Um, Dusty Baxley and I uh, met about five and a half years ago, Dusty, and uh, went out to Virginia to check out this brand new state-of-the-art facility called Boulder Crest Retreat. And they were working on a product or a, a program called post-traumatic growth. And they're taking seriously injured veterans, bringing them into this retreat and emerging them in facing the demons or the things that are inside of them and coming out better people. And uh, they're already good people, but coming out better, having more tools and resources and knowing that there's nothing wrong with them, that something just, they just needed to face what was in front of them or in their mirror or in their past or something along that lines. And what I discovered through the, I think I've been to 10 of them now, Dusty? Uh, I've attended multiple ones, and I've taken past DAV leaders like Bobby Barrera and Maricelia, um, Jim Sursley, uh, Dave Riley and Yvonne Riley, uh, Dennis and Donna Joyner, and Dick Marbs have all attended these events with me. And uh, I got with Sharonda, and I said, hey, let's, let's do a women veterans retreat that DAV is proud to, to pay for. And so Sharonda and I started working. This took about a year to put it all together, worked with Dusty. And I think to date, DAV has done 12. DAV and the Gary Sinise Foundation have done 12 of these events along with Boulder Crest. Um, so we take these seriously injured veterans that are going through the, the RISE program through the Sinise Foundation, and we partner, partner them up with mentors like Jim Sersley, Dennis Joyner, Bobby Barrera, have them come and bond, talk about how life was back when Bobby Barrera 
and Dennis Joyner came back from Vietnam and how life is today. And we, st we said, hey, let's expand this. Let's get women involved, women veterans. They have the same needs. We need to have them come through this. So this past December, uh, we did our first retreat, and Stephanie was one of the participants. Um, Sharonda was a participant as well. And it's a remarkable partnership. Uh, it's like no type of therapy that's being done at a VA facility. Um, it is very holistic. A lot of us do not realize everything that we're doing to ourselves day in and day out and how good it is not for us. Um, the, from the food you eat to the activities you do to your decompression or your downtime where you unplug, everybody in here has got an iPad or an, a phone or a Samsung or something. You're always looking at always playing a game, right? Be, jazz, be jazzled or jeweled or whatever it is. You don't ever put it down. You got to unplug, get your mind to reset. So they, they do a lot of things there. You know, again, from what you eat in the morning, everything is farm to table. It is, the community has embraced them. Um, you do exercises in the morning, and everybody has a, dis, a disability of some sort. That's why you all belong to the Disabled American Veterans. You have an injury. But there are activities that you can do day in and day out to promote a healthy lifestyle. And then meditation. I know the first time I heard about meditation, I laughed in Dusty's face. And I said, I'm not doing that crap. But it works. It absolutely works. And it's something that Dusty teaches at this retreat. And it's not an all-inclusive paid vacation. This is a tough six days. You have got to be honest with yourself. And if you're not going to be honest with yourself, you're not going to take anything from that retreat. And it doesn't just stop there. You just don't do six days and boom, you're magically cured. There's a 16-month cycle where they're following you. They're tracking on what you're doing. And everybody comes out of there a changed person. It's kind of like uh, when I go to the winter sports clinic or I go to the tea tournament that DAV co-hosts with VA. I see people reluctant to do something on the first day. But come day three, they're ready for the following year. It's the same thing at the retreat, and I'll let Stephanie talk about it and how she felt about it in Sharonda, if they'd like to add comments about it. But it is a different, you are a different person when you leave there, and they give you those resources. And you're there with people who have the same, same issues, common bonds. And uh, I think Sharonda's got a great relationship with everybody that she's been through. I think you've all gone, you stay in touch and are doing your thing. But those are the exciting things that DAV, DAV is doing for each and every one of you, and we're glad to do that. We are the tip of the spear when it comes to being a veteran service organization, and we are taking care of everyone. Dusty is a great friend of mine, as is Ken Falk, the founder who bought this land, donated it back, and helped establish this retreat. And they've done everything well ahead of the curve with the support of DAV as well, financial support of DAV, um, to make this thing an all-inclusive retreat to where you can go out, unplug, face your inner demons, if you will, and come out a better person. And that just brings us full circle as an organization in that we are doing different things, not traditional stuff that is, uh, it's working, so. John, while I have you here, um, can you tell them a little bit about Volunteer for Vets while you're up here? Okay, all right, so volunteerforveterans.org is a new online resource that we have established. We rolled that out at the Midwinter Conference in Washington, D.C. this year, and we continue to develop it and uh, add it as a resource to complement the Local Veterans Assistance Program, a program that DAV started back in 2007. And we've always, you get asked everywhere we go, we got to get the younger generation involved, we got to get the younger generation involved. Well, they don't want to push paper, they want to do everything from their smartphone, going back to us unplugging, right? Uh, but it's something that you can use, it's, again, an online resource where you can build a profile as a veteran, as a volunteer, as a caregiver, or on behalf of somebody. You can be the conduit uh, to make a, um, a life-changing impact on somebody who has a need. So anything that is involved in your community, if your neighbor is a veteran, a World War II veteran, and he or she cannot mow their grass, I can build a profile for them, act as the conduit, find, talk to my community, find some volunteers who are willing to come out and do that, put that together through that online resource. We did a seminar this morning at 8 o'clock. I'll make sure that our uh, 
presentation is put on the members only portal. Uh, I ask each and every one of you in here to build a profile as a veteran or volunteer, however you want to use that resource, share it through your social media outlets. Uh, you, once you build your profile, you find a need, you can share that. Uh, it's a great resource and it's going to help complement and take DAV well into the future and make, help us stay the premier organization. Thank you. Give John a warm round of applause. Next, we have Mr. Dusty Baxley coming up, and let me just take care of this. All right, give a warm round of applause for Dusty Baxley. Hopefully you can do a little bit better than that. I'm really nervous. <laughs> Thank you. All the female veterans in here, please stand up. Please, stand up. Exactly. Thank you. I wonder sometimes if all of you, not just the ladies here, but all of you, remember how remarkable that you are. Sometimes I think you forget. In today's society, 0.45 of 1% of us now put on a uniform and stand in harm's way. That's 99.55% who have not a clue. Let that sink in for a minute. All of you make up around seven and a bit percent of our overall population. 320 something million of us. Stop and remember, lest we forget. You're amazing. You stood up for this country. A lot of us don't come from very privileged childhoods. A lot of us do what's necessary to get through this life. And we find a home in the military. We find a brotherhood. We find who we're supposed to be. And it molds us. And thank all of you for not letting it fully define you to go on and do something better. And it'd be greater than that. I so appreciate you. So, I'm this guy that is the most luckiest man, I think, probably that you're ever going to meet. I served from 1972 to 94. I had my share of deployments. Came back from Iraq, no wife, no kids. Too many times downrange with the 82nd. I was pretty upset. I turned my back on this country. I went to Australia for 15 years to get as far away as I possibly could. I came home in January 2009, pretty broken very successful in business, and was lost. Couldn't sleep, couldn't get out of my head. Had some anger issues, I think they told me. Very hypervigilant. I was struggling with some symptoms that I was unaware of. Gave it all away. Had married the second time for all the wrong reasons, as we do after the first one. <laughs> Thank you, honey, this third one, I'm getting it right, God bless you. Um, she still puts up with me every day. I'm so amazed. But when I came back, I checked into VA, and they told me that I was suffering with this disorder. I had no idea what was going on. I'd been gone for 15 years. I was like, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm drinking a bottle a night, and I'm waking up most mornings with a pistol in my hand and the roof of my mouth torn up and ashamed of myself because I couldn't let go of this life. There had to be something better. Definitely not medication. I'm definitely not sitting around talking about it. Talking about it didn't do me any good. So I began this journey of self-healing. This lady that, such a smart lady, talked me into going to a reunion in the 82nd, and I found out that we're losing 20 to 22 a day. I couldn't hardly stand up. 
there's two or three o'clock in the morning doing what we do, right? We're all sitting around, there's two or three hundred of us doing 16 ounce curls, talking trash. And we're looking on the phones trying to find each other. And the more that we talked, there was a sense of hopelessness. And he looked over at me and said, Ranger, you look a million bucks, what are you doing? And I'm thinking, oh my God, I thought I was this little special snowflake that had his own little issues, right? We're all the same. We all stand shoulder to shoulder. And so on this journey, I came across Boulder Crest Retreat. Master Chief, E9, EOD Bomb Tech. Served 21 and a half years, retires, forms a company called AT Solutions, anti-terrorist solutions. Becomes very successful because all of us know we went from mounted patrols to dismounted patrols and we started stepping on things. The company taught over 55,000 men and women to engage IEDs. Very successful. Retired and went back to school there in Georgetown, originally a Washington boy. His dad was a Washington cop and a veteran. And he had learned about setting at bedsides. His mom had died when he was seven years old. She was only 29 of cancer and he'd sat at her bedside for two years watching her die. So he was pretty good at setting at bedsides. He went through a war, a period of our war around 19, I guess 2010, 2011, where EOD community of bomb techs over a period of 12 months, 71 of them became amputees. The war's first quadruple. That little community now is facing, they lost 134 downrange, or now about 135 suicides. He wanted to help. So he was going to bedsides there for 12 months, about every four to five days, there was one of his community arriving to the hospital as an amputee. It was breaking his heart. So he donated 37 and a half acres of his own land and decided to set up a retreat, initially a bed and breakfast, for all of you to come and join us. It's the nation's first privately funded rural veteran and military wellness center located in the first ridge of the Blue Ridge Mountains, about 50 miles west of DC. And he was doing this for the severely wounded. And he was attending a fundraising event and he found this one young lady sitting in a corner crying. I said, what's wrong? She said, I wish my husband would have lost a limb. That's the most horrible thing you could hear. I said, what's wrong? My husband's suffering with PTSD and he's tried to take his life twice. This guy I work for said, we gotta do better. Started traveling the country trying to find answers of all the experts for PTSD. He found a resounding answer. We don't know what we're doing. We don't have an answer. We're doing what's mandated by Congress. We're doing modalities that are unsuccessful. We're looking at 700,000 post 9-11 veterans that are in need of help. If you multiply that times the average size of a family, we got two and a half million people in need just in post 9-11 veterans. We gotta help. So we started working on a program. We had therapists and everybody with a great idea. <laughs> and the more the combat veterans that were there invested in this program learned it wasn't about the modalities. It wasn't about a clinical setting. It wasn't about talking about it. It was about doing something about it. Slowly but surely, we developed a program. As John said, seven days. We're catch and release, and we said, got to do better. Let's make it an 18-month program. Let's track this. Let's do something with it. So after 18 months of study, come to find out we're three times more effective than any modality in the world for PTSD. Go figure a program developed by combat veterans, taught by combat veterans for us. It takes us to help us. So along the way, males, we said, my God, we gotta look after the ladies here. Let's figure this out. So we begin inviting ladies to come to us. And by the way, it's completely free. You can come and stay with us, two to seven nights, anytime you want, the most beautiful 37 and a half acres you've ever seen. It's beautiful. It still looks like the first day we built it in 2013. And the more that we got into this program, we realized that we had found something that was unique. We were getting these amazing results. So we invited Dr. Rich Tedeschi to come, along with many other psychologists to evaluate the program. At the end of two days of a seven-day program, the guy went back and wrote a journal entry and said, we accomplished more in two days than the mental health community can in 12 to 14 months. Whoops, we must be getting it right. Military training. Guys, remember PT? Ladies? 
We start every morning 0630 with BT. We get on with it. It finishes every night, 8, 30, 9 o'clock, around a fire. Good old Ranger TV. And we're not singing Kumbaya and roasting s'mores. I can guarantee you that. The point of this is that I got this opportunity to run across Gary Sneeze Foundation and DAV. You people are a blessing. God bless you. God bless you. Your support to what we do is unbelievable. It's an $11.5 million facility completely paid for. And we're reaching out and we're raising around $6 million a year to be able to look after our fellow combat veterans. Now we have a facility out on the west coast just south of Tucson. We have a $10 million gift. We now have two facilities to do this. And it's based around post-traumatic growth. This is specifically a ladies' forum, so I want to make sure that, number one, I said to Sharonda last night and to Stephanie, this is going to be hard for me. And yet I know that it's not. I've had an opportunity to share and walk the same sand with you and to watch you walk through what you've done. And the lady said something to me that I don't think many men here in this room, or maybe some of you do. You know, we like to reflect back on the brotherhood. I knew that when I was in uniform, I met a lot of fantastic men, but I think at the time, it really didn't register within me. And as years go by, I reflect on the finest human beings I ever stood shoulder to shoulder with. And you know what, ladies? That may not have been necessary in your case. Your brotherhood actually might have been an enemy. It actually might have been a threat. And that when you came home, talking about a brotherhood wasn't a comfort zone. You lived in a danger zone. So I've been very well educated over these years on what you struggle with. And what we've learned is life is truly a struggle. I don't see any kids out here. I'm an old 63 grizzled guy here. Life is a series of ups and downs. You're all old enough to know that. Is that not true? Life is a struggle. You know, when you achieve it really good, you struggle well. Life is a series of ups and downs. But what happens to us when we're suffering with these symptoms is it's not just a series of ups and downs. The ups with the adrenaline, and we all know it, are way too high. And we hurt the ones that we love. And then we judge ourselves. And we isolate and we self-medicate. So I'm going to describe what we call a negative spiral that we've come across, and I know that I did it myself. Anybody here ever find yourself talking to someone that you love deeply? And all of a sudden, it went from zero to 60 in an absolute millisecond. And the person that you love is looking at you like you got three heads and what the hell's wrong with you? And for a second, you stop and realize, pardon my French here, I'm an asshole. Hmm. That actually makes me feel good because I like the adrenaline because it's how I've been trained. Now I'm ashamed of myself. So I go down to the man cave and I self-medicate. And then I isolate. And I find myself in this circle. Not being able to sleep. Not being able to face the ones I love. Because I've been trained to fight, flight, or freeze. So I don't freeze and I don't run. I'll damn sure fight you. But I didn't realize that how I was trained, sharply tuned threat perception. Anybody ever train for that? Does that sound right? After action reviews and tolerance of mistakes, emotional control and combat, adrenaline, the ability to, to engage, the brotherhood. I can go right down and show you where all of those are our symptoms that they say we have with PTSD. Can you imagine? So what we share with the people that come to be with us is, it's not what's wrong, it's actually what's happened. And for you ladies that are out here, God bless your souls, I'm so glad you're with us, because what you endured, I could never endure. You are amazing, one and all, from what I've learned about you. So what we offer at Boulder Crest Retreat is a different shift in the paradigm. In Veterans Administration, we want to treat the symptoms. We want to talk about these symptoms. We want to medicate you for those symptoms. We want to engage you in modalities that at the end of it, there's only a 2.2% success rate. And they only measure the length of the modality, not the fact that you go right back to PTSD at the end of the modality. So we've said, hey, you can't address the symptoms. You know why? There's nothing wrong with us. It's actually what happened. You can't change what happened. But by God, we can change what happens. And we can change what happens and go forward. And so what we truly believe is that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. 
And then the, what we began to teach is post-traumatic growth. So if around 30 to 31 percent or more of our post-9-11 vets are suffering with PTSD and our Vietnam vets were around 30.6, let me share something with you very quickly. Hanoi Hilton, 1973, 592 veterans returned. They'd been incarcerated, if you will, held captive, and he went from nine months to 10 years. A lot of those guys were out of the Hanoi Hilton, Hoa the Fiery Furnace. Out of those 591, what do you think the PTS day rate, rate would have been? If we're at 30, 31%, would you think the men that were held in captivity? You'd think 100, wouldn't you? you think every one of them would come back. Their families were warned that they would come back vegetables. They would come back and have to be incarcerated, put away. 4% returned with PTSD, and those were the newest guys in captivity, not the oldest ones. My God, what do you mean? Can anybody imagine anything more horrible than being tortured and being held in captivity in an eight by eight cell in darkness? Yet these men came home and out of 591, 17 of them became general officers. Seven of them became admirals. Many of them come to, le to lead our country. What happened? Leadership. Standing shoulder to shoulder saying, no matter what, we will come home better. Call the Stockdale effect, the commander. At the end of the day, they said, it will not kill us. It will make us stronger. We will come home better for this experience. And I believe that each of you are stronger for what happened to you. And it has changed your lives. And it will forever change your lives. It's kind of funny that in our society now, if we have discomfort, we go to a doctor. The doctor gives us a Percocet or a Valium or a Xanax, and we feel better, and we go home. It didn't change the problem. It didn't change how we needed to address it. At the end of the day, we have to face our demons and we have to grow from them. And what we've learned is we need each other. And if we're gonna struggle and struggle well, we need to be together. So females, ladies out here, I admire you. The program that DAV has supported for us, and thank you, John, and thank you, DAV, my God. It's been amazing. You guys put in a wheelchair lift for us. You guys actually put in bidets in every single one of our rooms. Can you imagine? I had no idea those things were so important. <laughs> the front switch you gotta stay away from. <laughs> the things that have been done and the heart that's been given to us has been absolutely amazing. And having the mentors come in, Jim Sersley, to have him so powerful sit there and say, I remember laying on a couch and, my, and I yelled at my mom to bring me a glass of water. And she said, get off your ass and get it yourself. And he said, uh-oh. And he literally, as a triple amputee, had to drag himself into the kitchen, pull out drawers, and climb up on a shelf to get a glass. And he realized right away he needed to get off his butt and do something. I think Jim owns 33 houses and owns a roofing contract company. Can you imagine having a triple amputee show up to estimate your roof? <laughs> I want to see that boy get up there. And he can, and he did. And so it's amazing to see everything that's been given to our new amputees and our new disabled because of you, because of your voice, because of how hard you've worked for us to be recognized and to be able to mentor these young men and women to come through this. So for us, we think that we're onto something that's very special. I wake up every single morning and look my old self in the mirror and say, another 20 are gone. I can't, I can't fathom this anymore. I've lost too many friends, too many loved ones. And so we want to stem this, the tide of this by shifting the paradigm and actually on a micro level teaching as many as we can. And if there's two and a half million, I'm going to die a long time before I can reach them all. But on a macro level, and this is where you come in, we need help legislatively to give VA the power to have a different approach and have a wellness-based approach. Provide an education system so that we understand physiologically, psychologically, emotionally what's going on inside of us. And there's nothing wrong. And stop medicating us. Every one of you carry a very heavy rucksack that you've gathered through your life. All of you deserve time to stop, take the rucksack off, and figure out what you need to carry and what no longer serves you. And you write a new story going forward. So we've entered a different phase. Post-traumatic growth. 
and honestly believe it does the work. Every one of us know that when we do our work, we live better. How many of you here sleep unself-medicated eight hours a night? Damn, all those hands went up fast. And we all know what sleep deprivation looks like. It's hard to plan. It's hard to have goals. It's hard to have a future because you can't even hardly stay in the moment with sleep deprivation. And when you're medicated, it's hard to start the next day. So on an average of seven to eight medications coming out of VA for my PTSD, it's really hard to connect with the world, much less have a bowel movement. You guys know what I'm talking about. Don't, don't laugh. It's the truth. I'd much rather try to figure this out and grow from this. Every time we drop a knee, we step back up and we're stronger. But I'm going to say to you now, you need each other. I love the, I, I love the passion of Sharonda and John Kleindies. They inspire me to want to do better. You should inspire each other to want to do better. What I learned from being away from this country for 15 years, and I was the only American, they called me the mad American. I was quite, quite proud of that. I killed their industry, sports nutrition. Smashed it, became the number one sports nutrition in the country. It took me six months. Something about us old NCOs, we have a PhD in GSD. We get shit done. I took out an operations order card and said, let's go. We can do this. But what I found when I was struggling and when I couldn't sleep and when I was questioning my anger issues, when I was questioning my inability to connect with people, what was wrong? I didn't have you to call. I couldn't pick up the phone and, and, and call a fellow combat buddy and say, hey, dude, I'm, I'm drinking about a half a bottle a night and I, I can't sleep. My wife can't stand me anymore. All I am is just this ball of anger and people leave. What do I do? I needed you. So I encourage you to need each other. So as we go forward carrying this torch, we have to be able to shift the paradigm within the system that we operate in to shift from treating these symptoms based and leaving us medicated with a, a diminished version of ourselves for the rest of our lives and no longer to ever be that person. So if I have a trauma and I drop below my baseline, and your answer is to medicate me and leave me here, I never actually reach my baseline. What we say is you're stronger than that. And you can actually go above that baseline and be greater than you ever were and be a person that you never ever thought you would be because of the positivity. So what I ask you is stand shoulder to shoulder. And I would like to thank you from Boulder Crest Retreat as we seek this mission to slow this suicide rate to join us. This has to be done from a wellness-based approach. We will never be able to change what happened to us. We can truly change what happens as we go forward. Our life is lived moment to moment in appreciation and gratitude. So from here, from this position, number one, God bless you and thank you for having me here and let me stand before you. Thank you. And number two, let's keep this mission going. Let's stay shoulder to shoulder and help one another. Our country is in need of leadership at this point. I think we know that. We need you in our communities leading. That's what we need. You've been trained to follow. You've been trained to lead. You are heroes. That's a hard word. We define hero as an ordinary person who has survived an extraordinary experience and returns home to share that wisdom with their community. I challenge you. Lead. You're the largest VCO, VSO in the world. I admire your power. Continue to flex it, and thank you for your time. So the next portion of um, this presentation is going to be some question and answer uh, opportunities to talk with you about our experience as we went through um, Boulder Crest. So members of the Interim Women Veterans Committee are coming around to collect your cards. If you have written questions down, um, please see them in the red shirts. They will be picking them up and we also have some questions here that we'll begin with. Uh, 
First, I'll be proposing a question to Dusty. Um, having had both male and female PATH classes, is there a difference in the way that the groups respond to the training? You're women, aren't you? Yeah, there's a definite difference. Uh, the ladies seem to bond much faster and come together much quicker and recognize their own needs together. And they dig in a lot better and they stay closer connected as they go through the 18 month program. It's interesting that when you fill out a 45 minute application and we do several different um, interviews till you come because you need to be ready for this type of program. You need to have gone through the system and found out that VA is not maybe what you need. You've tried other things, you're tired of self-medication and it's time for something different. And so it's interesting when the ladies come because your battlefield is completely different from the battlefield that we actually faced. And um, Stephanie, how did you feel before the training? So I was pretty isolated. I think that a lot of us have had this experience, but in the moment, in the time, it was about 13 years that I'd been out of the Army already. And I thought that I was the only one who felt this way. And um, I think as women veterans too, a lot more of us end up being caregivers. A lot more of us are married to veterans who may also have problems. So um, I felt very alone. Um, I didn't wanna ask for help. I didn't want to accept help. Um, but do you want me to keep going? Okay. Um, it was actually Sharonda that uh, I reached out to through a mutual acquaintance about this program because nothing else had been working. Um, going to an hourly counseling session every couple of weeks didn't help. Um, I was, and full disclosure, still am on several medications for my post-traumatic stress and anxiety. Um, but I was augmenting that with my own self-medication, with alcohol and other substances just so that I couldn't feel the things that I was feeling. Um, and I knew that I had reached a point that I had to change. I had to change because I wasn't engaging with my kids. Every year they get older. I didn't want them to grow up with a mother who is a zombie because I was, I was trying to uh, cage my anger because as a caregiver of two children, that's what you have to do to survive. Um, so when I reached out to Sharonda, I think that she really kind of got the sense that I needed that help and that it was really hard for me to ask. And she just took it from there. And there was no way that I was going to be able to afford to fly from Texas to DC for this program. I had no idea what it was. I just knew that everything else had come up short. And so she, you know, made the arrangements and I got to the, um, to DC and that was how I was feeling before I started PATH. And uh, how about yourself, Sharonda? How were you feeling before the training? Um, so b prior to Boulder Crest, um, you have a sense of existing. So you get really good at um, what you think is living but you're really existing, you're not thriving. So I really had no idea my state of living until I attended the retreat. The retreat. Um, you know, being, having been assigned, I was thinking, okay, you know, I'm going to go and I'm going to participate from a distance. But John said, no, you're going to go and participate. Um, so I was very thankful for that opportunity. But um, the first day there, um, it really began to peel back those layers and I found out that I had just been existing um, in front of many of you. Many of you have seen me for 10 years now in this organization, and I got pretty good at existing. Um, but now I'm on my way to living, um, thanks to the tools that Boulder Crest was able to provide me with. And um, I'd like to ask, um, I'm going to go to Stephanie first, actually. Um, before you headed out to the retreat, Stephanie, what kind of reservations were you having about going? And did you still have those same reservations once you left Boulder Crest? So initially, my reservations were, what is this hokey shit? And <laughs> is it going to be like, is this a cult? Is it going to be just more of the, you know, the self-help terminology that we hear? Um, and but don't absorb and am I just gonna be 
you know, listening to the same stuff that I've been reading in the pamphlets, and um, I didn't, obviously I didn't have those feelings when I left. I've been converted. I'm in the cult now. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, that's a joke, obviously, but I, um, I really feel like all, like, it sounds hyperbolic, but it changed my life. It changed my ability to see that I, that I have potential, that I can do things instead of, you know, um, just waking up every day after taking sleep medications the night before and, and medicating every day through, um, I, I still struggle, but I am struggling better. I have tools that I got from Boulder Crest that help me identify my um, coping mechanisms and why I'm doing them as opposed to trying to smother the symptoms that I'm having. So. Thank you. Um, and Sharonda, what about yourself? Um, I know we discussed this a little with the committee before, um, but why don't you share with the group what kind of reservations you were having before attending and were those still with you when you returned? So prior to attending, um, I had never been in a group setting. Um, so I was scared to death of being in a, a group setting and exposing myself um, in front of others and um, because of the line of work I've done, um, the group settings would have been with my peers, with, with um, other veterans that I may have worked on their claims and that type of setting. So I had no um, intention of ever being in a group setting. Um, but I can tell you, uh, once we were there and once we were talking, um, it became apparent that we all were experiencing some of the same things, and we all had something um, in common. Um, I, I'm not a combat veteran, and that's something that I advocate for, for those women that are not combat veterans or those veterans that are not. There are experiences that we all have um, that are based on our military service, so we must remember to not just exclude um, the opportunities for help to just those combat, we want to we want to help everyone. So, so after um, after getting there, um, I, I now have a different perspective on group training. Um, it was very controlled. Um, even the guides, the path guides that were with us, they were not. It was not like they were not part of the. They were, it was not like they were standing outside. They were actually part of the group. So it made it very easy for us to open up and really share moments. Um, we've all cried together um, during the, the PATH training. Um, and I'm glad you mentioned the, the group there, Sharonda. Uh, but Dusty, I did have a question for you. Um, what does it look like working with these ladies? And you know, how did you see them? It's interesting for all of us because as we go through this journey of life and we fill up this rucksack and have all these problems, um, supposed problems, because at some point someone tells us there's something wrong with us and at some point we believe there's something wrong with us and we go down that road. And when these ladies came to us, it's, you gotta remember guys that we're only doing this like six at a time. And the number of guides are six. We want this to be one-on-one. -on -one. We want this to be what you deserve. I don't want it to be in such a group of 20, 25 people that you don't have your own voice, that you don't get heard. And so a small fire team so that you can lean into one another and go forward. And what I found with the ladies was, it's very interesting because I'm sure that no one here has any idea what MST is. It's interesting to see the strength in these ladies and to see them lean into one another and address that and embrace one another and then grow from it. Because what happens to us in life is we fill up with so much anxiety and so much stress and things that happen to us that we have a tendency to react to everything in life. You ever notice that? You react. If you're confronted with an action, you react. You ever find yourself listening to someone and you, before they've even finished talking, you've already formed a response. And actually you're helping them finish their own sentences. We don't even, 
we don't even listen well. So being able to respond to life is so very important. So when Sharonda and Stephanie talk about the tools, just taking a breath and stopping and creating some space so that you can actually respond to somebody. Because we get trained very well to respond from here to here. You are masters at solving things. You react instantaneously. You don't respond so well. So if we can create that space where we can stop and turn this heart back on again, we can actually respond to life. Because so many of us, it's exactly like the ladies, it came to us and their hearts were turned off. It's interesting that they, you hear it out of their mouth, say, I love my husband, but I, I don't feel anything. And so I, I don't know why I feel this way. I don't know why I can't feel. I don't know why I can't connect. I don't know why I'm angry. And these are things that we ask our mental health professionals and they can't give us an answer. We have an answer. The answer is you. And so with the ladies unique, we get to learn every time they come through because they teach us something not only about ourselves, but about our old journey that we have together. So the journey to respond to life is the key. Wow. Thanks, Dusty. Um, actually, I'm going to go to Stephanie next. And Sharonda, I'm glad you mentioned um, the group setting because that's a big reservation for many. Um, regarding being in that group setting, Stephanie, um, did you feel like there was any one-upping? Like battle stories? Like yeah, like stories? were you feeling challenged or feeling like, um, you know, like, there was people who were speaking and trying to one-up. How, how were you perceiving others' reactions or the way they were telling their stories? Were you feeling challenged in that way? Um, I didn't feel that way. I was actually, I, sh I shared similar reservations with Sharonda. As someone who's introverted, I don't talk to people. I don't like people. Um, so I, I was like kind of standoffish at first and use, I used humor as a, as a defense mechanism. Um, uh, so I, I actually didn't feel that at all. I felt like the way that the program is designed, it's a safe space from the moment you start. Everybody, like they lay ground rules about um, how we're gonna share and um, how we're you know, respecting other people's space and respecting other people's stories. And I didn't, I didn't feel that at any time it was a competition. It actually started to feel for the first time um, in a long time that we were team members, that we were working together, and that every time somebody shared something difficult, I heard part of my story in that. And so it started to become more and more apparent every single day that, that over and over again, you're not alone. And um, one of the things that I heard during the program that really spoke to me because of my um, tendency to self-medicate was that the the opposite of addiction is connection and that that connection with that group and with the guides in the PATH program was starting to heal me in a way that I didn't I didn't ever um, even understand was possible like I didn't think that it was possible to heal that or that there was even the potential or the capacity to connect with people in the way that I did during Boulder Crest and after because we're still communicating. I have friends for life now that, you know, when you get out of the military or you get out of college and you think, like, how the hell am I going to make friends? Well, just, like, go to this retreat and share all of your past traumas, and then you'll have friends. <laughs> Thanks, Stephanie. Um, Sharonda, what about for you? Were you feeling that way? Were you feeling like you were being uh, one-upped, if you will? Um, <clears throat> no, I wasn't. Um, the, as Stephanie mentioned, the, the program was very structured. So um, there was no time for that. Um, we were emotionally involved from day one. Um, and something that was taught to us as well, it was say what you mean, mean what you say, but don't say it mean. So that helped facilitate the flow of our discussions. And I mean, we didn't, I mean, there are some of us that knew each other but we didn't know each other on the level that we got to know each other there. And it was very intimate, very, um, there are things that those ladies know about me that my mother doesn't know. <laughs> and it's gonna stay that way. <laughs> 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 
but um, it was very, the, the program, I can't say enough about it. I've spoken um, to a number of people about the structure of the program. Everything was well thought out, thought out from day one to the day that we departed and how we departed and how we're connected now. Um, it's not perfect. You know, we, we have some kafluffles um, in the groups, but we still love each other for the most part. And um, like Stephanie said, that's my sister for life. She's not going anywhere. Uh, and next, actually, Stephanie, I'm going to ask you, what do you feel like was your biggest gain from being in a group setting that way? I feel like... Um Maybe the other people don't agree with me, but personally, I felt like I was kind of one of the last ones to let my guard down. Um, <laughs> you laughing? No, maybe she agrees with me. <laughs> like, I wasn't crying. I was like, I'm not going to cry. Mm -mm. Um, but then every time Dusty talks, I cry. So it's, um, I think the biggest gain was just just cracking that shell open. And it was, it was, it was hard. It was a tough, it was a tough shell. And, um, you know, I miss it sometimes, but, but I'm a better person. So the group, the group setting was really, um, you know, it, it doesn't force you to open up, but it, it just kind of persistently, like every single day, every single minute, every single exercise we're doing, we're like, all right, Stephanie, open up, let, let yourself feel this shit. Um, so, yeah. I'm, I'm not going to apologize for my language, so. And I guess it sounds like you, you guys both gained a sister for life from what you both said. Um, so actually what I wanted to ask you next, um, I'll stay with you for a second, Stephanie. Um, I know that we talked about a lot of different healthy habits that you were learning while you were out at the retreat. And have you been able to continue those healthy habits? Um. So, for example, some of the things that we're taught, as Dusty mentioned, um, are breathing exercises, and they're very specific. And um, the first time that I did it, I was actually, I think, I was in a room with John, who's another uh, path guide, and I was doing these breathing exercises. And I got so much oxygen in my system that I actually felt the same way I feel when I smoke pot. Like, I felt high. I felt like whoa, like you can breathe in the airport and not get in trouble and feel this good. So that's something that I do, I do it all the time now. Um, um, and meditation, uh, I think was actually one of the most profound gifts that I got. Um, transcendental medita meditation is a mouthful, TM. Um, and I learned from Diana, three of us learned from Diana and three of us learned from Dusty. And um, I, you know, my feelings about hokey shit, I was like, oh, okay. But it's like, it's, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of TM. If you haven't, you should definitely read up on it. It's one of the least hokey meditations that exists. It doesn't, it doesn't force you to get rid of your thoughts. It, you just are. And so it was one of the ways that I became more in tune with myself. You get to know yourself. You're like constantly, we have this narrative, right, about what we're doing, how stupid it is, or super critical, all of this. And we never actually stop to just be. And so that was another one of the, the tools that I learned. And I haven't been really good about it. I'm wearing this today because it was a gift from Dusty as a reminder to do meditation. Um, so I have it. I have it in my back pocket, though. And the breathing I do all the time. Um, I take better care of my body as far as how I eat because I understand after eating homemade meals from, um, I forgot her name. How the world? You did too. <laughs> Renee, we're <laughs> blanking. Renee, uh, best cook ever, like made everything specific to our dairy, dietary needs. And I learned that when I don't eat dairy, I feel really good. So. I was like, I think I'm lactose intolerant. She made everything, every meal for seven days without dairy. And so that was another thing that was like, oh, okay, if I take care of myself in the way that I eat, I can feel better and I don't have to focus as much energy on that. Um, and I think maybe you could talk about some of the other ones if, if I didn't cover them all. All right. 
So I was kind of hoping that uh, we went to another question and I didn't have to answer that in front of Dusty because he gave me my uh, TM instructions. So um, so I, ha I have to say life happened and um, I wasn't able to keep up with the routine as I'm supposed to. Um, it was really, really, really strong out the gate and I was doing everything right and um, I got hit with a couple of things and I was like, all right, I got it. Everything's good, you know, four, seven, and eight using my breathing and, and all of these things. And then I got hit with another punch. I was like, okay, wait a minute, I'm dizzy. Okay, well, I can't, I got something to do. I can't meditate today. So um, um, I'll do it two times when I get home. <laughs> and after a while, you know, you develop, you, you slip back into your habits. Um, but something that Dusty has always said to us, and he said it to me the other night, you have to take care of you. You have to make time for yourself. So remember that. So it's, it's very important, and that's, that's something that my mother is always telling me. You know, we make so much time to do all of these other things for everybody else, um, but the things that, that really will make us healthy and keep us healthy um, we put on the back burner when it should be the other way around. So that's my goal, and that's something that we were taught, is to start um, taking care of self. And when you start slipping out, to lean on each other, to try to find um, your, your ground, gain your footing again. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go back to you, Dusty. Um, we have some questions coming in from the audience. Uh, and the first one I have here is, how can we get more information, and can women without combat PTSD go? Yes. Um, BoulderCrestRetreat.org. Um, we're all over YouTube. We've been in several documentaries. Um, but Boulder, like a big rock, crest like the toothpaste, retreat. Let me say something about this. It's called Boulder Crest Retreat. I want to explain something that these ladies went through. It's 48 modules. It's 74 contact hours over seven days. And that's arriving on the evening of one. So five full days on the ground. These ladies work. It's bright and early, and they are challenged every single minute. They don't have access to their phones. They don't have access to a schedule. They actually come not even knowing what's going to occur. So it forces you to be in the moment. Anybody ever do that to you when you're forced to be in the moment? That shit sucks, doesn't it? Huh? Because you can't get out of your head. You actually have to be present. Whoa, isn't it tough to be present? So it's interesting the way that this, the way that this occurs. So I'm going to definitely say, yep. Uh, I have another question from the audience here, too, for you, Dusty. Um, someone noted here that there are other issues than PTSD that are affecting some of us. So what about people struggling from things like chronic pain or musculoskeletal pain or fibromyalgia? You're above my level of care. Thank you. I'm not a we're not a clinical answer. We don't believe that for PTSD there is a cure. Okay, so let's be clear on this. Okay, so two major missions. One is rest and reconnection. You deserve to have a five-star retreat for free. You've earned it. You should come out there. And do as much as you want or as little as you want and just be. So that's for you. You should have that five star. We've got two facilities for you that will blow you away. Come out and be with us, please. And then the, the other part of this is it just, it's just it's the, the very difficulty of the program itself. So you've got to be able to stay in it to win it. Okay. Thank you. Um, my next question is actually going to be for you, Sharonda. Um, this is coming from the audience again. Um, they're asking for an explanation on how they can find women veterans. Um, a lot of the males in their area wear the hats, and the ladies do not. She's a very strong uh, supporter, and she would really like to help some other veterans. But how could she help find other women veterans to help? Funny you ask. So um, the first thing and the most probably the easiest is to ask. Ask the question. Um, it's one of the things that I talk about during Veterans Day is to ask the question instead of assuming that mm, she's not a veteran. So that would be the first step. Um, when you're in the VA hospital, ask the question. I mean, you got a high percentage, a high shot, a good shot there. So there are a lot of women veterans that are walking through just waiting to be engaged. Um, so if you engage them, 
most likely um, they'll be welcoming and receptive. And then once you get them, welcome them. Welcome them. Put them to work. We like to work, you know. Um, in the chapters, teach them what it's about to be a part of DAV. Let them feel the, your passion and let them be active within the, the chapter um, when they come and visit. But ask the question. Thanks, Sharonda. I'm going to jump back to you, Dusty, for a minute. Um, we have a question from the audience here. They're wondering if there's an age limit on the sessions, and they're wondering, do camps have similar aged women, or is it a mixture of ages and generations for each particular camp session? It's a mix. It's everybody. So we're, as you can imagine, we don't advertise this program. Word of mouth alone is overwhelming us. You know, we've got two facilities, and we're now expanding this. And so we've taken it into a curriculum. So we have a 320-page student guide that becomes a workbook for 18 months. we got a course syllabus. Obviously, we have an instructor's guide. We're military. We teach to a standard, do we not? It's how we do business. Okay, so exactly. So we follow the guidelines on this. And so with this thing, it's, 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 it's very meticulous in how we have to be able to do this and be able to follow it up. No age limit whatsoever. I've got a program coming up that's pre-9-11. I got one guy coming through, he's 82 years old. And he said, I'm really worried because somebody else might deserve the seat better than me. And I said, I'll carry you on my back. Come, let's do this. Uh, my next question is going to be for you, Sharonda. Um, we have folks from the audience who are wondering, what would you advise or what advice would you give to another woman veteran or a fellow woman veteran regarding Boulder Crest Retreat? Hmm, there's so much to say. So um, regarding Boulder Crest and pretty much anything that you're going through, first, you're not alone. Um, so many of us think that we're by ourselves and we think that to be strong, to be silent. And it's, it's just not that way. Um, speak up, stand up, ask for help. Don't try to do it by yourself. And don't assume that you're the only one, because I can tell you, after going through that retreat, um, I learned so much and that we just have so many things in common. And I can tell you in having conversations with some of you out there, no matter what age group um, and, or gender, for that matter, there are so many things that we have in common. So the my best advice for you is to stand up, ask for help, and be open, be receptive. Don't hang on to those old habits and let them keep you bound to your old circumstances. Um, let go. And Stephanie, what about you? If you had a fellow woman veteran who was asking for advice, what type of advice would you give her? I mean, I would definitely recommend reaching out to Boulder Crest. They don't do cold calls, so they're not gonna come find you. You have to ask for help. And um, I think that is probably the biggest thing that I would say as well, is ask for help. Get over your pride <laughs> and ask and accept it. And don't be embarrassed when, when people offer help. Accept it and know that you're worthy of that help and that you deserve it. I'd, I'd like to add something to that. Uh, when you call and ask for the help and they say they got a spot for you, commit to that spot. Uh, I get a phone call from Dusty when we're putting these things together throughout the year. We're working on one for next month and people are pulling out because they say, well, I can't get out of work or I got to clap my new cl college class starts up here. Most schools, most employers, if you're honest with them and talk about it, they'll support you through that. So when you get that chance, and, man, I watch America's Got Talent, man. I'm looking for that golden ticket. You know what I'm saying? I got a voice like Fergie. But uh, <laughs> take that ticket. Go. Don't say I'll go and then call them a week later say, oops, I can't do it because something happened. Make the commitment. So that pretty much wraps up our Q&A. Oh, Dusty has something. Please write this down. Ken Falk and Josh Goldberg, our strategy director, they just went through our entire program and they wrote a book. 
Because what we understand is on a micro level, we're not going to ever be able to reach everyone. On a macro level, we've got to find a way to be able to get this word out. There's a book on the market right now called Struggle Well. It's, all, it's worth all about $9. It's the entire concept and work of the program put into book. We want to share this. We've actually offered this all over the country for free. There's a, a foundation down in Jacksonville, Florida, Gratitude America, that's standing up. We're training them for free. We're going to give them the curriculum for free. We have to help each other, and there can't be a price tag on it. It's our lives that are at stake. So we've got to stand up and help each other. And for me, as a, as a combat veteran, I want to say one last thing. Ladies, on behalf of all the men that have stood beside me, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the way that you were treated. What I've learned, we need you. I've learned so much. Like The smartest person in my life is the lady I'm married to. And that's a damn fact. And I have never been more amazed when she speaks. I actually stopped and listened. It took a long time to get that damn mature. She actually tells me I'm now learning what I teach. I shut my mouth and I listen. So we need you. We are all one. We need to stand shoulder to shoulder and lead ourselves back home again. The other um, location I heard you was Arizona. Okay. So if you are a chapter, I mean a department chair, women veterans chair, please stand, stand fast. And um, also if you are a chapter women veterans coordinator, please stand fast because we want to make the connection. There was a question came in as to how we can get more information out. Part of that is trying to find out who you are in your departments so that we can reach out to you. And we have some forms to take down your information. Um, please give everyone on the panel a warm, warm round of applause. <laughs>